Today's edition of Business Africa is about innovation and the will to take on the existential challenges facing the African continent. Welcome, I'm your host, Afolake Winloye. The top stories this week. Equitable growth for developed and developing countries dominates discussions at the World Economic Forum. The head of the International Trade Center shares insight on how this can be achieved. This year's Africa Economic Outlook calls for more measures to reduce structural budget deficits and public debt accumulation. The African Development Bank says more time is needed to repay debts. Sudan is among the countries hardest hit by the climate change but is also the world's largest producer of raw gum. We'll find out how the Central African nation is using trade to navigate climate change threat. At this year's World Economic Forum in Davos, the forum's discussion centered around sustainable solutions ranging from energy transition, reimagining globalization, inclusion and diversity to prepare the world to collaborate and share equally in all future opportunities. How can African continent position itself to thrive in an equitable global village? More details shortly. At this year's World Economic Forum in Davos, theme cooperation in fragmented world, more than 500 CEOs of the world's biggest firms attended, promoting a diverse mix of thought leaders and thinkers. Climate change aptly took center stage in discussions this year as energy companies turned up in greater numbers, as also financial institutions playing a critical role in just energy transition around the world. The triple threat of conflict, climate and cost, to which Africa has made little contribution but has been disproportionately impacted by, was also a central theme of the discussion at this forum. Organizations like AGRA, IFAD, UNAIDS, ITC and several others were in attendance to promote the needs of the African continent in the context of global inflation, leading to higher costs of living for ordinary Africans. The G7 could only commit $5 billion to build full security globally, leaving a deficit of $2 billion. Despite the global pressures, Africa's investment landscape is gaining attention. There is renewed interest in Africa, especially with the African continental free trade area. It poses a big opportunity for Africa. Executive Director of International Trade Center, Pamela Cook Hamilton, joins us to elaborate more on that issue with an African focus. Welcome to the show. Now, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, you um, emphasized on the need for a more equitable green transition. Um, highlighting the differences in fortunes for those who can afford electric cars. Now, what exactly needs to be done to achieve this equity? The inequality that we see is that it's a hard truth. It's built into the system. So the first thing we need to do is, one, we need to make a decision that we want to change this, that this can change and that we will. The other thing that we need to do is to be intentional. We have to decide and put in place specific measures that are time bound, that are measurable, and that allow us to actually ensure that actions will be executed. Because at the end of the day, we can talk a lot, but we need to make it happen. On, on the aspect of you know, green growth, we can't sacrifice development for action in, in climate change. The two have to work hand in hand, because if we don't do that, we will end up in a double-edged sword where people will be losing their way um, people will be losing their opportunity for development, while at the same time, uh, developed countries are fulfilling their mandate for mitigation and addressing climate change. You also highlighted the need to invest in SMEs, arguing that it would greatly accelerate the attainment of SDGs. Now, how can SMEs in developing countries position themselves in order to be able to benefit from such investment? I think there are a few things. I think one of the first things is to point out that access to financing continues to be one of the biggest challenges for uh, small firms. And small firms make up 90% of companies and 70% of jobs. So they are important. But less than 5% of global sustainability investments go to small firms. Why is that? There are several factors, and this is one of the things that ITC works with along with companies. The first is to get your papers in order. Many of the companies don't have a proper bank account, don't have proper inventory management, they need full record keeping. And at the same time, they also need to be able to understand how the system works. 
Our She Trades initiative provides this kind of targeted support, especially to women entrepreneurs. The second is they need to ensure that there's a diversification of their suppliers and also a connection to the business support organizations and the peers and buyers so that they can be more resilient when shocks come. So in other words, if one buyer stops making purchases, they can actually shift to a new one. And then the final is just investing in upskilling. This is a huge, um, this is of paramount importance. Why? Because the world has changed so dramatically in terms of what is needed in a new um, economic paradigm. Now, why is it important for organizations like yours to have a global system to help facilitate trade? The issue is that trade is has always been fundamental to life. You know, trade has been taking place for, for you know, billions of years. We've been doing what we've been doing and trade is actually good. The fundamental issue now is what kind of trade? What are the new rules that we're willing to look at? How are we willing to build an inclusive trade system? How are we willing to ensure that development takes place alongside the changes uh, that, that matter? And so for me, you know, looking at how the world system has changed so drastically since, you know, first of all, the Second World War, but also even since uh, 30 years ago when the Uruguay round was completed, you know, we have to begin to think differently and to redefine what it looks like. What are the new rules? Um, we look at the fact that the digital world has exploded. Where are the rules for that? There, the volume of trade now is 40 times what it was in the early days of the GATT. You know, and also we look at the environment. This is a, a key aspect that was on, on the agenda at Davos. And gender, there are no rules there also for how do we actually carry out women's economic empowerment and prioritize these in, in the agreements. So I think it's also important to begin to drill down on some of the specific areas that progress needs to be made to incorporate a, a new dimension in trade. Well, thank you very much for those insights. Thank you. Now, 23 African countries were either over-indebted or at high risk of being so. In September 2022, the 2023 African Economic Outlook revealed. Now, the outlook prepared by the African Development Bank warned that this level of indebtedness is alarming and that African countries may need more time to repay. Let's explore more highlight of this report. Per African Development Bank estimates, GDP growth should stabilize at 4% in 2023 to 2024 after slowing from 4.8% in 2021 to 3.8% in 2022. The bank says inflation rose to 13.8% in 2022, up from 12.9% in 2021, and that an additional 15 million people fell into extreme poverty in Africa due to high global energy and food prices last year. The report cautions on the current global and regional risks, which include soaring food and energy prices, high interest rates, and the associated increase in domestic debt servicing costs. Climate change with its adverse effects on food supply and the potential risk of political change in countries holding elections in 2023 are equally daunting threats. The report calls for measures to reduce structural budget deficits and public debt accumulation, as well as effective coordination of fiscal and monetary actions and stimulating intra-African trade. On that, the bank says it would like to see support from rich countries to their low-income counterparts, possibly in the form of additional time to repay dates or the reallocation of IMF reserves, the famous special drawing rights, to the countries that need them the most. Gum Arabica raisin tapped from the acacia tree is used in everything from soft drinks to pharmaceuticals. But for leading world producer Sudan, it is also seen as a key weapon to fight against desertification. Let's find out how from this report. A vast belt of trees vital for global production of fizzy drinks helps Sudanese farmers adapt to climate change. But in the harsh dry lands, many are reluctant to take up the trade. Sudan in northeastern Africa is among the countries hardest hit by climate change but is also the world's largest producer of the raw gum. Farmers also have to contend with wide fluctuations in the price of gum on world commodity markets. 
The return barely covers the cost of production. Fatma Ramli is the coordinator of the Gum Arabic Farmers Association. It's unrewarding for these reasons, that if I tend to the trees when I'm thirsty, hungry, without health care, without infrastructure and unable to educate my children and so on, the returns go to others. Sudanese exports of raw gum totaled $110 million in 2021, according to central bank figures, making it one of the country's key foreign exchange earners. 45 kilograms of raw gum can fetch up to 25,000 Sudanese pounds, the equivalent of $43, depending on the day's price. Since South Sudan broke away a decade ago, taking with it its large oil reserves, Gum Arabic has been one of Sudan's main foreign currency earners. Sudanese exports account for 70% of global gum supplies, according to AFD, the French Agency for Development. And that's all we had for you on Business Africa this week. As always, share your feedback with us on social media at African News. For more business stories and news, stay tuned to African News and AfricanNews.com.